So tomorrow being Independence Day and today the uh, eve of Independence Day, you know, the government of India has this huge program of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa. And as Victoria Memorial Hall also falls under the uh, kind of umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, although it's an autonomous organization, it's funded by the Ministry of Culture, for those who do not know. So the Ministry of Culture usually wants us to do some of these events. So we thought it's a good idea to look back and see in the last 75 years whether the pledges of midnight have been fulfilled to a large extent or not. So it is formulated positively so that uh, uh, people who want to speak for the motion have a lot to say, and people who are speaking against the motion, I'm sure, also have a lot to say. Uh, we have a panel of eminent judges uh, uh, and our able moderator here, but before we introduce them and um, the proceedings get underway, I would like to request Shagnik Bhattacharya, who is the coordinator of our activity club and who has been spearheading this entire arrangements for this afternoon's debate to come and say a few words and introduce the judges at least, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Raman. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable judges and esteemed guests, uh, fellow debaters, although I'm not a debater, so that's, a, that's wrong, sorry. Um, we stand here today on the threshold of a discussion that holds immense value, I believe, and also promises a very riveting debate. The motion on the floor is that this house believes that the pledges of midnight have been redeemed. India's Independence Day speech, or what stands to be India's Independence Day speech in 1947 by the first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, echoed across this nation with resounding words, at the stroke of the midnight hour when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom, which is also where, from which we have taken our uh, theme of this. Nehru's powerful address, popularly called The Tryst with Destiny, uh, transcended mere words and ignited a vision, a collective hope of prosperity, democracy, and progress. Today, as we gather in this vibrant city, we must critically analyze whether those visionary pledges made at the stroke of the midnight hour have truly been fulfilled. 76 years have passed since that historic day, and countless milestones have adorned our nation's journey. We witnessed remarkable achievements, economic growth, advancements in education, science, technology, and healthcare. India emerged as one of the world's largest economies and undoubtedly the largest democracy, embracing diversity and fostering an inclusive society, which is always a continuous process. However, as we delve deeper into the reality around us, we confront pressing challenges and lingering inequalities. Poverty continues to haunt a significant section of our population. Discrimination faced by millions based on gender, caste, religion, language, region. Corruption casts a dark shadow on the pillars of democratic governance as it does all around the world. And environmental crises call for an immediate attention and access to quality education remains far from universal. Therefore, dear friends, our task today is to critically examine whether the glowing promises of that fateful night have been adequately fulfilled. And it is your job to argue and convince us and to take that light forward. It is through this deliberation that we shape the path ahead and continue to build the India that our Prime Minister, since Nehru, have envisioned and imagined, where every citizen thrives in equal opportunity and leads a dignified life. Thank you. Before I uh, depart uh, this lectern, let me introduce our judges who have kindly agreed to uh, judge this debate. First, uh, Ms. Srimati Swati Gautam. She's an entrepreneur for 33 years, and Swati Gautam is the founder of India's only brand of fitted intimate garments for women. Alongside, she holds a master's in broadcasting from the University of Sheffield and has been a lecturer of journalism and marketing at St. Xavier's College for many years now. She is a contributor to newspapers with her own fortnightly columns and has authored, among others, the official coffee table book of the West Bengal Police, as well as co-authored the sesquicentennial volume of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. She is also a trustee of the Calcutta Debating Circle and enjoys debating in both English and Hindi. And finally, last and perhaps one of the most important, <laughs> is that she is a fundraiser for many charities, including her own public charitable trust, Pukar. 
So a uh, round of applause for Scott Tham. Mr. Priyam Marik is a media consultant for All Cap Communications based in Kolkata. He completed his BA in English Literature from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata in 2019 and his MA in Journalism and Documentary Practice from the University of Sussex in 2020. He currently works across several media verticals including corporate writing, publishing and journalism. As a journalist, he has written for Indian publications such as The Telegraph, The Wire, The Print, Deccan Herald as well as international publications such as The Diplomat. Um, our third judge, who I believe is somewhere in the gardens right now, if I'm not very wrong, uh, yeah, is uh, Ms. Moyuri Mukherjee, who is breaking the monotony of St. Xavier's College alumni. Uh, Moyuri Mukherjee conducts regular debate and public speaking workshops for schools and colleges across India. She works closely with the Calcutta Debating Circle, representing the organization in various international and national events. Moyuri was a student delegate at the Difficult Dialogues London School of Economics South Asia Summit in 2016 and a member of the Calcutta Debating Circle UK India Debate Tour held in London in 2017. In particular, she has held a long-term association with the Heritage School Kolkata and has coached their students to win several prestigious debating awards. She has also been associated with the Lotus Valley International School Noida, where she conceptualized and implemented a public speaking module integrated within regular classroom learning. Moyuri is an alumnus of Presidency University, Kolkata, and the Delhi School of Economics, and currently is about to begin her PhD at New York University. So, a round of applause in absentia. Uh, who exactly needs uh, an introduction to Mr. Pradeep Guptu? Please raise your hands. Bless you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Mr. Pradeep Guptu is one of the best known writers on business, economics, and a biographer of the men behind businesses. He runs his own research, survey, and writing company for Kolkata at present. Ah, Ms. Moyuri Mukherjee is here. And in absentia. He was resident editor of the Business Standard for a decade, besides serving as the secretary of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, vertical head at the Economic Times, and founder of the Dhaka Business Daily, The Independent. He is a founder trustee with Dr. Kunal Sharkar and Dr. Shondeep Chatterjee of the Calcutta Debating Circle. Institutionally, CDC organizes long format public debates besides providing support, scholarship, back training to adult, young adults keen on debate and public discourse. So we really couldn't think of any better person than Mr. Pradeep Gupta. A round of applause, please. Thank you so much. I will not bore you any, more, any further. I would hand over the proceedings of this afternoon to Mr. Pradeep Guptu. Uh, just a small announcement. Uh, one of the participating colleges, uh, Loreto College, has not yet arrived and uh, we have not received any word whether they will be participating or not eventually. So they were by the draw the first speaker because nobody picked number one. Uh, so we'll just start with number two and we'll proceed and see where it goes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pradeep Guptu was introduced uh, at length, but then I just wanted to add that uh, uh, there was a lot of talk about St. Xavier's and uh, presidency. He is a diehard La Martiniere. See, so, uh, so we have variety over here. Uh, but also, I would like to add that uh, the secretary and curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, Mr. Samarinder Kumar, will be joining us during the proceedings and will be there towards the end to hand over the certificates and so on. So over to you, Pradeep. Thank you, good afternoon, and thank you to all the colleges for attending this debate. I think the motion is a very emotive one. It's something that uh, I'm definite agitates your minds because it agitates the minds of those who have come before you as well. Uh, nations have a strange way of existing. Uh, these pledges that we talk about today are, um, we're not very sure uh, perhaps who made them. Was, were these pledges only limited to the ones that Nehru and the government made or did the Indian people also make some pledges on that day and how long, how far have they been fulfilled? So the ownership of the pledges and so many other things, but first the rules of the debate which bear repetition, although it may be intensely boring. Each team, of course, has two speakers, as we know. The participants uh, will get four minutes to speak. A bell will be rung after three minutes. 
by my worthy timekeeper on my right, which indicates that only one minute is left. And after the fourth minute, I'm sure he's going to hammer away at that thing, so you better stop. The, then there's an interjection. Um, you are free to ask the question if you are based in the other side, if you are on the other side of the floor. And um, if no question is asked within 10 seconds, full marks for the interjection will be given to the speaker against the allocated column. The marking system is content, arguments, language, delivery, and interjection. Uh, contents is 20, the others are 10, so that's a total of 50. Each team, therefore, can score up to 100 points if they max this debate. Uh, the tabulator, of course, will add up the l total marks at the end of the judges allotted by, the, by all the three judges, decide the results. There will be prizes for the two best teams, and um, in only one situation alone, this is not a debate, which is the decision of the judges will be final and binding. And thank God I'm not judging you because I'm sure we'll have a very brilliant debate. Um, my only request is uh, to observe the time and to uh, not to make uh, it bears repetition. Uh, no personal names, comments, no specific uh, allegations, please. Uh, you might speak on an issue. We are not here to target individuals this way or that. Um, with these few words, the motion is before you. Uh, Shagnik, you said redeemed, it's not redeemed, it's fulfilled. This house believes that the pledges of midnight have largely been fulfilled. And um, as I said, nations have a strange way of operating. Nations make pledges when they are born and then these pledges evolve over time. For God and country no longer resounds with God as strongly as it did when it was first written into the Constitution of the United States. So new pledges come in, but we are not here to discuss the new pledges because we in India have the redoubtable honor of modifying our Constitution for the greatest number of times. The law students will know this much better than I do. For the greatest number of constitutional amendments in the last 75 years of our independence. So it's not the new pledges. We are discussing the pledges made at midnight. And if you think the amendments to these pledges by themselves re reflect a non-fulfillment, you're free to take up that issue. Um, also, I am reminded of, OK, the law students, please do not laugh at me. I'm reminded of this very famous statement made, I think, by the late Ashok Sen when the 2G scam dis uh, judgment was announced and he said, there are pledges and judgments which are, which are being implemented and there are some that are not implementable. So we also have to understand whether we made any pledges that were not fulfillable or are we still in a process of fulfilling them? So let's see, this is a nuanced debate. I think all of us recognize that we live in a great country. It's one of the most outstanding nations to have obtained its freedom in the 20th century. We have a track record as a nation, not perhaps as governments individually, but as a nation of having made achievements and strides that are quite impossibly true the excellence of our IITs, the brilliance of our medical sector, the humanism, the amount of the degree of activity. And I'm very proud of this in particular, the, the sort of work that NGOs in this country have done. It's quite unbelievable. If you take a, a credit and debit balance and you see the total at the, on the credit side, it's quite remarkable. And above all, we did two impossible things at midnight. One is that in a, in a land where nobody, nobody ever had been equal, we granted ourselves universal adult franchise, abolishing in one stroke all our thousands of years of history. None of our great grandfathers had ever the thought of going to a ballot box and putting in a piece of paper. They never had any say at all, but we did. And more importantly, we gave rights to the Indian woman, at least the political rights. 
much before most of the world did. So these were not pledges. This is how we are. But it's the pledges that we are going to discuss. So the first speaker for the proposition, maybe I should tell you the names of all the debaters. Calcutta National Medical College, Shwagota Ghosh and Shobhik Shah. Shwagota and Shobhik. Okay. Welcome. Heritage Institute of Technology, Ochishman Mojumdar and Rajorshi Paul. Ochishman and Rajorshi, thank you. Presidency University, Mandrita Datta and Siddhartha Roy. Mandrita and Siddhartha. Shikshayatan College, Ornu Mitra and Shayantika Biswas. Jadavpur University, Oritro Ganguly and Ekalopo Bhattacharya. St. Xavier's College, Avishek Chobe and Muskan Agarwal. Department of Law, University of Calcutta, Natasha Aziz and Nilanjan Bose. Natasha, please wave, shake, I mean, you know, whatever. So let's have our first speaker opening the motion, Shagota Ghosh from the Calcutta National Medical College, which has a lovely annual debate at the time of the reunion. So over to you, Shagota. May we have a round of applause for our first speaker. A very good afternoon to everyone. I'm Swagata Ghosh from CNM Chet, and I'm going to speak for the motion. A tryst with destiny. It was a historical night, and this was a historical speech, which we all heard or read in books or throughout media. Throughout the speech, Jalal Nehru moved back and forth from what is and what could be. He dealt a major relation to what is reality and also what could be. In the very first line of his speech, he says, we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. I want to highlight very substantially. He himself accepts the fact that we cannot be an utopian nation. We cannot fulfill all the pledges completely. It is an impossible task at large, but in striving to do so, we can cause betterment of the nation. In his speech, he pledges for the freedom and opportunities to the common man be it peasants or workers. Tomorrow in the Independence Day, as we are going to see, our Prime Minister, who rose up from the position of a mere chaiwala, and our President, Srimati Draupadi Murmu, who is a woman of the tribal community up there at the highest position possible in our country. This shows how much we have come forward. Jalla Nehru said, freedom means ending of poverty, ignorance of disease, and inequality of opportunity. I'm going to deal with them one by one. Back in the years, famines wrecked the villages of Bengal, Orissa, Bihar. Today, our country is not only self-sufficient to feed itself, but also exports engineering as well as agricultural goods. It has redeemed itself from the shackles of poverty and is now bringing currency back in the form of value, thus increasing the country's prosperity. Earlier, our country was crippled with diseases like leprosy, polio, smallpox. Today, through years of the national immunization scheme, polio has been eradicated and other infectious diseases have been sufficiently controlled. The marginalized sections of the society have been able to come out of their economic disabilities with the help of societal reforms and the initiatives of the government and now at the face of the nation. Again, I would reflect back to our current president. Jawaharlal Nehru also emphasized in his speech on the socio-economic justice. This our country vastly did through the increasing of elementary education. By the time of independence and still now, the literacy rate has gone up by six times through midday schemes and national education policy, Sarva Shikya Yajna and many others. Today, our Indian minds are the CEOs of multinational companies outside worldwide, be it Sundar Pichai or Satya Nadella, Lina Nair, and that's just the beginning. Our Indian texts and books are being translated into different languages for the world to read and understand. For example, Gitanjali Shri, she won the Booker Prize for her book Red Samathi, which was translated into Tomb of the Sand. I'd like to also mention the fact that our country is thriving as the world's largest democracy. Today, granting equal right, equal right to vote to each of the inhabitants has been done, which many people could not even dream before. 
Today, our country sees various women people in front of the board in different positions, which were also not present before. Today, as a sovereign nation, we are capable of taking our own decisions without the need to look up to US, Soviet, or other superpowers. Lastly, I'd like to end my speech by saying that Jalla Nehru had said then, there is no time for petty and destructive criticisms. Today as well, let's not let the negativity hinder us from seeking forward and working for the sake of empowering our nation. Thank you. You spoke about peasants and workers getting equality and opportunities, but how would you justify that? Because we see workers going in hunger strikes every now and then. Like in the last month itself, we saw a few workers going in really hunger strike. So how is that going with the statement? Execution is very much different from what has been stated. Execution is always in progress. Even in the most developed country, execution fails sometimes. And if there is no hunger strikes, the point will not be uplifted for the betterment again. So at a point, these things are needed for again the amendments to be done. So you mean the execution has not been done? Thank you. Thank you. Um, opposing her from the Calcutta National Medical College is Shobhik Shah. And um, are we settled? Please start. <clears throat> so I'll start in three, two, one. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Shavik from CNMC, and I'll be speaking against the motion. Now, my speech will be structured in three parts. First, I'll talk about the paragraph of pledges in the iconic speech. Then I'll talk about the system in which these pledges are meant to be fulfilled. And finally, I'll speak about the major shortcomings in the system. Now to appreciate and address the motion, first let's classify these pledges as being either tangible, measurable and thus so far estimable and those that are not, right? What are these pledges? These pledges are uh, to bring freedom and opportunity for the, to the common man, to fight and end poverty, ignorance and disease, to build a prosperous, democratic, progressive nation, to create social, economic and political institutions for justice and fullness of life and finally inequality of opportunity as Nehru promises. In fact, panel, at the very outset, let's acknowledge that this historic speech was made in the background of Nehruvian economy, of communist socialistic tendencies, but the current economy is much more free market, much more capitalistic for some pledges to actually ever be fulfilled. Let us acknowledge that currently, 1% of the population makes 40% of the wealth, and 3% of the wealth is given to the bottom 50% of the population. Issues like inequality of wealth, which by extension translate to inequality of opportunity, as Nehru promises, can perhaps never be solved by virtue of shifting systems of economy. Freedom and opportunity to the common man. Panel freedom isn't just rejecting our colonial overlords and replacing them with Indian overlords. In fact, bonded labor in 2018 afflicted 80 lakh Indians. Bonded labor is still a reality. When we speak about caste-based discrimination horizontally, we often forget the vertical economic discrimination it brings upon. Caste is an economic segregator right now. Look at manual scavenging in the heart of the nation. Look at, uh, ladies and gentlemen, look at the face of Musarihars surviving on rats. They're not even allowed to stay in the village that they service. Caste does not make you an outcast, does not just make you an outcast. It dictates economic mobility. Poverty, ignorance, and disease, three quantifiables, ladies and gentlemen. Poverty is sustaining on less than uh, 32 rupees per day, and 14% of the population does not even earn that much. 13% of boys. 12.3% of girls drop out of secondary education. <clears throat> Why do they drop out? They drop out because they have to become breadwinners for their own uh, families. They drop out because of poverty. And when they go into farms, when they go into mines, they are afflicted with COPD, they are afflicted with respiratory illnesses, thus overburdening because their young bodies are not capable of analyzing these stresses, thus overburdening the health already burdened healthcare sector of uh, the country. So here we recognize that these issues, these pledges, in fact, are interrelated. We can't just take one and move along. We have to take them all. On that note, yes, we have prospered. Yes, we have progressed, as my fellow speaker did point out. But have we prospered and progressed equally and for everyone? Have we had, ladies and gentlemen, sabka saath, sabka vikas? Because in recent times, uh, and in fact for democracy, as Nehru promises, everyone does have a voice, but some voices also have microphones. We have been categorized as electoral autocracies. We have been categorized as partially free democracies by institutes throughout the world. And finally, I come to the point that there is a premise for this promise. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a premise that must be maintained. And there are two premises that Nehru provides us. One, that we will be they will be representative of the sovereign people of India. 
And in front of me today, I see a healthy mix of the genders. But in Lok Sabha, there's only 15% women. In Rajya Sabha, there's, only there's less than 15% of women. The young, median, the young India has a median age of 28, ladies and gentlemen, but the, uh, the, but the Lok Sabha has a median age of 54. The Rajya Sabha, it's even higher. In fact, equal citizens with equal rights, privileges, and obligations, that's what Nehru promises. But do we have that? If we don't have the premise, can the promise be delivered? That is a question I raise. Finally, what many of the speakers will probably fail to notice is that immediately after the paragraph of pledges, Nehru speaks, there is no resting. There is no resting till any of us redeem our pledge in full. And we have been resting, ladies and gentlemen. So I rest my stand, but I do not rest. Thank you. Uh, lovely speech, sir. So, but I have one small question. Like when you quoted stats for us, they are absolutely right. But do you ignore the fact that 200 years, we were slaves to the British for the last 200 years. How do you expect, uh, you know, to a swift growth in, the, in poverty or anything what you are quoting in just 75 years? So do you mean to say that 200 years is equal to 75 years? Thank you for your question. Uh, how I choose to answer this is that we are not we are not analyzing the entire history of India right now. We are talking about if the motion entails, if the pledges have been largely fulfilled, which I digress. They have not been fulfilled. Far from it. We have a culture of complacency regarding these pledges. And I hope you got your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shobhik. And um, Urchishman Mazumdar from the Heritage Institute of Technology. Uh, the fact that we are a third world country still, uh, that's a fact, right? Uh, I think we are all trying to uh, say we are the third world country, but we've set some economic targets that are really staggering for, uh, for an economy, a trillion dollar economy, uh, half trillion dollar export market. So let's see what our friend Ochishman has to say on the pledges and their yeah. fulfillment. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Archishman Majumdar, and I am speaking for the motion. Now, something that side opposition has come up and said about economic disparity, about uh, challenges in current society, is something I think of a more nuanced take that needs to exist. Is when Nehru made those promises through those pledges, he was talking about a very nascent country, right? Those pledges were made in context of a country which was divided at that time with bloodshed across the borders. So, what were those promises primarily, right? That was bringing freedom and opportunity to people to the common man and that today exists. Coming to the point of opposition where they said that uh, caste uh, is there still a challenge to mobility, right? From the side of the government, the side that Nehru made those pledges from, there are uh, points of reservations, there are points of uh, legal repercussions that are there against discrimination, there are uh, methods that empower people from those critical sections of society. The very good example of that is our very prior president, right? Who is a tribal woman herself. Now. Something else that was uh, something else that was mentioned uh, in I think was one of the opposition speeches was uh, that whole thing of uh, development or those targets whether they have been achieved or not. Right, like the question raised by uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, one of the members on my side was that we are Nehru the pledges that were made to Vice Nehru were trying to undo the harm that was done over a period of 200 years. Something that we as a country have achieved in 75 years is quite, quite frankly a staggering uh, figure, right? Now coming to some of the constructives from our side is that today we as someone from Gen Z, the promises of inclusiveness, the promises of being uh, there for the other person of our fellow country people have largely been fulfilled, right? Because uh, let's take the example of like I was saying of Gen Z itself. We are shy to ask for a ketchup packet, but we'll go to war to make sure that people have equal rights and equal opportunities, right? How did that become inculcated in our generation is because we learned that from our fathers who learned from their fathers who were there at the time of independence, right? So again, it's, it is a very uh, simple, uh, how do I say, very simple logical uh, explanation to arrive at that is that is only inculcated in our generation because of the education we have received, because of the values we have received and that as such uh, is the reason why that whole pledge of equality has been fulfilled. Another way, another uh, 
very uh, good example of that, of being there for the fellow countrymen, is that we, as we saw during uh, the time of COVID, right, people were, uh, such as laborers, were returning from their home, but we have to also uh, highlight the effort that the common people made to make sure those people had some help, right? People were handing out water, people were handing out resources, right? So again, like I say, that, uh, that freedom and opportunity to the common man is there, to the peasants and workers of India, uh, to help them is also there, right? Now to fight and end poverty, ignorance and disease. Again, that is also where that whole point of inclusiveness during COVID came up, right? The, the, you help your fellow neighbors, you fellow help your fellow countrymen. Now, uh, I think our time is running out. So I would like to finally say that uh, the social, economic and political institutions which will ensure justice and fullness of life to every man and woman have also been fulfilled, right? Our justice system is one of the most equal ones to exist. Our social reforms that have been pushed forward by the government have been one of the most uh, expansive and inclusive that have been there. And in terms of economy, uh, we, are, we are growing at paces that were currently unachieved by other countries or not seen in history. I think barring China, there are no other countries which received such uh, uh, economic growth, right? And that is the the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, CEOs across the world are Indians. Uh, com Indian companies across the board are uh, some of the highest uh, have have uh, highest growth markers, right? So I think with that, I would finally like to end my speech by saying that. Uh, uh, disease, COVID, compassion to travelers and the indomitable Indian spirit is what sums up the pledges and how those pledges have been fulfilled in the current context. And uh, if there are any questions. Right. He's brought in a new component of justice. And the yeah, you have a question right away. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Wonderful speech. Uh, uh, he, uh, don't say sir. He has a name yeah, and his so name sorry. is Orchishman. So Thank say you. hi Orchishman, good Orchishman. speech, bad speech, whatever. Uh, so I have a question for you. Uh, when you spoke about the reservation system, so my question basically comes up is hasn't the reservation system actually widened the gap between various caste groups because we normally uh, now and then hear about uh, caste based violence everywhere around the country. Yeah, uh, like I said, that is more nuanced context, not done in, uh, that does not do, ju does justice to the pledges that were made, because at that point of time, when independence, we were gaining independence, those pledges were made in the context of greater divides. Those divides, I believe, have largely been uh, mitigated, and the divides that currently exist are something that are a flaw of the current system, rather than the system that was there then. And again, to the point of, sir, I have never met the queen, let alone be granted a knighthood, so it's all right. Thank you. I, uh, it's, I always feel nervous when I'm dragged into speeches and questions and answers. Uh, anyway, so do sit. Do sit, Rachishman. And um, you know, uh, it reminds me of this, uh, all of us have seen this movie Lincoln, you know, where he says that it's, uh, what we are fighting for is not the equality of individuals, but equality before law. I think uh, a similar challenge exists before us in India, right? We are all equal before law, but whether we have accepted somebody as our equal mentally, spiritually, intellectually, or whatever uh, Ali wise, is still the question that we have to answer. So Rajorshi Paul from the Heritage Institute of Technology is up next, and he will speak in opposition to the motion. Rajarshi will try to tell us that the pledges of midnight have not largely been fulfilled. So over to you. All right. Um, I hope I'm audible. I'll just, yeah. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rajarshi. I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. And when we are actually speaking about the current India, right, the new India, the new India is different from that of the old India. The pledges which were made by Jawaharlal Nehru, while we are, you know, kind of seated in, on the foundation pillars of colonialism in India, in the very Victoria Memorial, we have to understand that there is very stark difference between the pledges which were made by then, the India then, and the India now, right? Why? Because when Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, kind of envisioned an India and made pledges of equality, of social justice, which were, you know, kind of imparted to everybody. He thought that people would not be, you know, kind of segregate, be segregated into the sects such as Bhats, liberals, Kongi, Sanghi, Riceback converts, or even pseudo-liberals, right? When we are talking about the changing fabric of India, which was, you know, kind of discussed before, we have to show, understand that we are not really changing the fabric of India. Perhaps we are just showing who we are, right? 
The point is, the divide which existed back then and the divide which exists till now, it's just been further, you know, kind of got down in those lanes, right? Because even today, we would refrain from saying Ma Tujhe Salam, rather go into Ma Tujhe Pranam, right? Why? Because our government considers there is a huge divide and would perhaps be, you know, kind of going into dividing people on the basis of their own religions. Perhaps a man with a beard would come up there on stage and say that, look, there is a stark difference between the Rams, are they? And as Dr. Shashi Tharoor would like to point it out, the Harams are there. When we are talking about there is a difference in the names, right? You would want to change your names from Hyderabad to Bhagyanagar. Why? Because you think that it invokes the other sentiments. When Nehru went, goes up on stage, his speech, his pledges which were made, were in context of the Hindu-Muslim riots, the intensive dilemma which Bengal was in, which Punjab was in, the intensive problem out there, the poignant solution, was the in intensive, you know, kind of the idea of safety, right? Public safety was a matter of question. In order to invoke, he thought about bringing the diversity together. What, en what it ended up in is by saying that unity and diversity, the entire populace of India comes together at one point when you have a problem and then says, oh, we have a problem and then you just leave the entire area, right? Because that's what happens today. Why? Because you still are racist towards Manipur. You still are racist towards the South. You still consider everybody to be different, right? Racism is still prevalent. You would still have, you know, kind of the entire idea of secularism to be, you know, precise. But then secular, you know, it's not secular, right? Because you would want to create a Hindu state. You would want to create a Hindu divide, right? Now, these are things that cannot be envisioned 75 years before, right? But here's the thing. When these pledges have been made throughout the entire rule for different governments, it was the condition that the nation comes together to get us to the place where it's equitable, perhaps if not equal, right? What we got was a divide which furthered the gap between the rich and the poor. As stated before, when there is 1% of the populace which is dealing with majority of the wealth, what you have is you equally divide des destitution rather than wealth itself. When you're talking about the entire idea of envisioning a new India, you have to understand that the restrictions on even media would go on to be, you know, kind of uh, detrimental towards the idea of making a nascent India altogether. When you are talking about Achedin, it's also understandable that when we are talking about Midnight Promises, at least Midnight Promises made in 1947 were better than the Midnight Promises made over November of 2016, right? When we are talking about encouraging communalism, when we are talking about narrow-mindedness, what changes and what remains the same after this very debate? Everything remains the same. Nothing changes. Why? Because today, they still are racist towards you. They still hate you. You hate yourself. And you hate your country, right? That's the reason why you would want to go to an international degree and pursue something else rather than stay in this country and try to change it, right? Because you know that the framework is the thing which is in question. Yeah. With... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, all right, questions first. Uh, you've already asked a question, so I'll go with him. Uh, Rajoshi, uh, fantastic speech, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the original definitions of equality and social justice have not changed. The implications of them have. That is what you mentioned in your speech, right? So uh, when, the, when the pledges were taken in 1947, they simply talked about following the definitions of these, uh, that they, they they uh, promised equality and social justice. They did not promise the present implication of equality and social justice. Of course, it has dip different implications throughout history. But if we just promised these things. We did not explicitly say what these meant. Do you have anything to say to that? Right. Um, so I'll just uh, mention that there is a very stark difference between conceptualization, uh, you know, kind of conceptualizing the entire idea of what these pledges are and institutionalizing them, right? Why? Because in your paradigm, what you tell us is, there is difference, there are people, there is the divide which remains. Today, after 75 years of independence, 75 years is not a short time, my friend. 200 years the British were here, they changed the entire system. 75 years is more than enough to undo all the changes there were back then. Today, when you are trying to institutionalize the changes, nothing changes. It's still the same. The divide still remains the same. Thank you. Take your seat. Thank you so much for uh, getting his name straight away. No, sir or madam. Uh, this is the least we can do for the 75th year of independence. 
And uh, Presidency University is up next, and that's Mondrita Dotto, who will speak in favor of the motion. As Rabindranath Tagore said in a Bengali essay, which I will translate, one of the most, my favorite lines were, Amadir Bari are Kormoketran Mudde, Bas Cholek into Mon Cholena, Tram Cholek into Mon Cholena. That is, I think, translated into English. We operate between two environments, our home and our place of work. While we go there ourselves, our mindsets don't change. So, over to you. So, uh, I'll begin in three, two, uh, one. So in a pit, when a group of frogs, however big or small, accepted their fate that they can never come out of it, one of them decided to jump so hard to get out of it, and when asked how you managed to do it, it said, I did not hear what the others were saying. I, I thought they were cheering for me. So we did fulfill our pledge of accepting the challenges of openness, of accepting our opportunities. So we uh, know that uh, one of the editors quoted that Jawaharlal Nehru would live to confess the failure of universal adult franchise in India. However, a new India enthusiastically participated in the free and fair elections, confounding all the skeptics, thus proving to the world that democracy is not just a luxury of the educated and the rich people. It gave voting rights to women when so-called developed nations didn't think of doing so, and here a pledge is fulfilled, however big or small, at least we have strived to do something for the women of the nation. We have rightfully bound ourselves to the service of the nation. Today, most of our uh, defense products come from indigenously built industries. Our imports are shrinking day by day when our exports of bulletproof jackets, ballistic helmets, snow boots, night vision devices have increased to nations of uh, West Asia, Europe, and other ASEAN countries. I just got a news that Singapore has accepted to import electricity from India. India is in a position to protect itself militarily from the ravages of China after the shock it received uh, during the 1962 war. It has also protected itself from Pakistan. It's, it is in a position where so many rival countries are together. We need to understand that 75 years is really less when, it, when you see our neighbors, our hostile neighbors. India has also furthered democracy, peace, and freedom when it has contributed to the United Nations. It has raised its voice against the racism that happens in uh, South Africa. It has sent peacekeeping operations in countries like Somalia. It has helped in the independence of Bangladesh. It has worked with the countries of ASEAN. Its Look East policy is a very celebrated policy. India can work a lot towards achieving global peace from the southern hemisphere of the, from the southern hemisphere of the world, the southern Asia. We have not just followed a policy by just blindly following what the West are doing. We have indigenously tried to prove ourselves to the world. We are the first nation in the world to do so in, the, in its maiden attempt after, the rival, after this period of being tortured by the British people and the first in Asia to reach the Martian orbit at such a low cost. One of our pledges was that we will never end this quest of our striving to achieve betterment. So uh, when our Chandrayaan mission to fail, we did not stop from sending another mission to moon to explore its resources. Our education policies, our Atma Nirbhar Bharat skills, skill development programs are being implemented on a rapid scale to uh, build the capacity of the youth. I have seen a farmer working day and night. I have seen a busy CEO. I have seen schemes of the government like Jal Shakti uh, uh, and uh, all the poverty improvement schemes, etc. And we have pulled out about 500 million people out of poverty in the last decade. So we are trying to be self-reliant. Our exports have improved a lot after the Green Revolution. We have also curbed diseases like polio. And we have also provided electricity and water to numerous households. So we are working. We are not sleeping. So I think that's the biggest pledge we have fulfilled. Thank you.
Um, hi. So I'll just get straight to the question, right? Uh, when the majority of the populace resides without basic needs or amenities or services, how is exporting electricity upholding the idea of equality that pe even when people are living in poverty, right? How is it upholding the pledge of equality which is given by Nehru, sir? I believe that a lot of Indians do receive electricity and water supply and the people to whom this has not reached, we are uh, implementing our transport and communication facilities so that it reaches to them. Uh, I would like to bring to notice that Nehru wanted us to substantially fulfill uh, the goals and today also the topic is whether the, uh, the pledges of the midnight have been largely fulfilled. So if not the entire population, I believe largely, if you col collect the cumulative responses, the cumulative goals, we have fulfilled that to a large extent. And yes, exporting to the other nations is one of the goals because that increases our GDP. Thank you. Right. Um, there is a Yojana, right, to send to deliver electricity to every village in India. What is the name of the Yojana? I mean, this was not meant to be a quiz, but I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, that's right. Good. Mayuri is off to New York to do her PhD. Evidently, she's been reading up a lot on India. <laughs> right. Um, so the t speaker against the motion from presidency will be Siddhartha Roy. Hello everyone, my name is Siddharth Roy. I am a student of Presidency University. Um, I'll go against uh, the motion. Uh, I'll start in three, two, one. 15th August 1947 marked the end of a certain period of suppression over, the, uh, over Indians by the, uh, by the British Crown, after which Indians could rule thyself. But the real question comes here. Uh, a real question arises on whether the Indian people are truly ruling themselves or not. Um, there were multiple challenges that emerged after independence. Uh, partition was one of the biggest challenge and its uh, subsequent con consequences. There was mass poverty, there was a lot of illiteracy, uh, there was low economic output and cap uh, capacity to produce. Uh, there were linguistic movements, there were secessionist movements, and there were multiple constitutional problems as well. Um, whether all of these problems were really fulfilled, uh, whether, whether all of these challenges were really so, um, were really um, solved by the intention of the government. Um, another, uh, you know, we would uh, rather call ourselves the we'll be, we'd rather be happy calling ourselves the largest democracy in the world. But um, of course, uh, it's um, many of the international organizations have branded our democracy as a flawed democracy, uh, as a flawed democracy, as from being free to a partially free democracy. Uh, democracy in India faces multiple challenges. Illiteracy is one of them. Poverty, gender discrimination if, is one of them. Free and fair elections in India is a distant dream because uh, there is a lot of r political rigging. There is a lot of uh, the, uh, corruption. There is a lot of uh, the uh, there is a lot of criminalization. Uh, 120 of the 500 plus uh, member of parliaments in the Lok Sabha have a certain number of criminal cases against them. Uh, casteism is another big problem. The caste system started long back when the Aryans first came to India and has continued ever since and is, uh, there's, no st there's no end to it. There have been multiple legal and constitutional developments to end the caste system. The great Indian reservation system is also one of them, but uh, to, it has come to no such end and the gap between these various caste groups has increased more and more. Um, when the Prime Minister of India in 1947, uh, in front of the Constituent Assembly of India, when he gave um, a certain amount of um, power to the Constituent Assembly to decide on the uh, uh, to decide on the development of the country, um, one of the most important principles that was put forward was uh, that of secularism. But then. Over the years, the government has failed to protect religious groups, has failed to protect minorities. We talk about the 1984 anti-Sikh 
massacre where uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of Sikhs were killed in Delhi, the 1983 massacre of people in uh, Nelly, Assam, the 1989 Kashmiri exodus of Hindu pundits, 1992 demolition of the Babri Masjid and the subsequent riots, and then we hear about the very recent events in Manipur and in Haryana. Um, secularism as an ideal in India has thus absolutely failed. Uh, coming to the most important thing of education and healthcare, which has been neglected, around uh, three to four percent of the entire GDP of India is uh, is actually uh, is actually a part of uh, is actually given to education and healthcare. Um, 60% of Indian population is still uh, still lacks access to proper healthcare and sanitation facilities, and we yet go around the world calling ourselves a very great country, providing equality of opportunity to all. Uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar had once said uh, that a nation cannot be built upon the foundations of the caste system. Um, uh, Women and child rights in India are also some important um, issues that have been neglected by the government. Women representation is also another important issue that has been neglected by the government. Pandit Nehru, in the last line of the entire Trist with Destiny speech, had said that we need to bind ourselves to the service of the motherland. But then, rather than doing this kind of a service, uh, it is, uh, this is a kind of a disservice that we are actually doing towards our nation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Why the same hands are coming up again? I need somebody else to ask a question. No? Good for you. Yeah, please, yours. Sir, I'd like to highlight this point that the problem of illiteracy has never been mentioned in the Trace with Destiny if you read it carefully. Still, after considering your facts, I'd like to highlight uh, some stats. The illiteracy rate from uh, 1947 was 16% and now the literacy rate, sorry, so now it's risen to 74%. Having known these stats, how would you like to defend your stance on illiteracy rates and uh, justify your stance that India is not a very prosperous nation? Uh, thank you, sir. For, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, um, as I spoke uh, about illiteracy, which is a problem for democracy in India, uh, illiteracy, illiteracy rates have, uh, of course, uh, gone up um, quite substantially, but it is, absol it is necessarily important that we um, ensure 100% literacy in our country. Many of the states in India have actually uh, achieved uh, 90 to 100% literacy. Many of the northeastern states, states like Kerala, the southern states have achieved 100% literacy. Uh, so it is absolutely necessary for the Indian government to also uh, make subs uh, subsequent strides when it comes to literacy. There, there is a high dropout rate. There is um, infrastructure, but there, uh, there is a pro proper school infrastructure, but there are no teachers, there are no students because there is a lack, there is a lack, or there is an in the, the, there is a lack of intention to learn. So that is what is most important that the government needs to um, make everyone aware how important education is a tool for upliftment. Thank you. Thank you. Take your seat. I, you know, you made me wonder of all the colleges here. I think there's only one which has been set up after independence, right? Shikshayatan was established when? After it. So only two out of seven colleges represented here uh, reflects the pledges made at the time uh, at midnight. The other five, I just noticed from the names and when you mentioned, because we are discussing a specific cutoff date, right? The midnight of, in that August midnight of 14th, 15th August, 1947. Interesting, uh, but we have to also admit that the growth of private education has been so substantial and so meaningful and so impactful in India today. It is indeed a parallel achievement of this country which we should be proud of. Anyway, so Sri Shikshayatan College uh, will speak next, and that's Orno Mitro. Orno will speak to support this motion that the pledges have been largely fulfilled. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Orna, and I will be speaking for the motion. Now, for the past few minutes, we have been focusing on how gradually from 1947 to 2023 or, you know, the modern times, how we have, you know, 
been able to and also not been able to fulfill the pledges but i think we must focus since we are talking about nehru's midnight pledges uh, we need to focus on the initial years because they were the toughest to combat because to you know we were known as the jewel of the british crown and from that we were crushed and to to you know build up that nation from nothing which we were completely exploited and looted by our colonial masters to you know through deindustrialization to a a a globalized privatized country you know we had successful um revolutions like the green revolution in the 1960s where we focused on food grain production the white revolution in the 70s which is the world's biggest dairy development program and the blue revolution uh, which is the rise in aqua cultural production all of this has ultimately led to india become one of the largest economies in the world now in 1947 the average um expectancy rate of lives was around 32 years but now people live way beyond the 70s and 6 uh, 80s and 90s and so in the initial phase people uh, most people were living in an age where we were su suffering from tb malaria children were dying of polio but we have been able to combat these things we have been able to fight these diseases through you know public awareness campaigns and 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 in 2014 we in fact became polio free and um in terms of uh, covid-19 precautions we are a country with the largest vaccine program in the world now apart from healthcare india has come a long way in science and technology there was a time where rocket parts were um, you know transported on bicycles and carts from there we have now recently launched chandrayaan 3 and this journey began um, in 1963 when we first launched our rocket uh, we first um, launched our rocket and um, then we also went into nuclear testing and they were covert clandestine operations because we were being spied by other first world nations who who were not letting us uh, you know uh, test uh, nuclear powers so you know we we did them through covert operations like smiling buddha then ultimately in 1975 isro launched our first satellite aryabhatta and so you know there have been apart from this i think the most important thing that we have to highlight is universal adult franchise we we as a nation we from the very beginning we implemented this whereas nations like usa they have struggled with it for about 150 years after their independence and fundamental right of education that is also very important yes i agree it's not perfect but it is still implemented there are programs like sarva shiksha abhiyan there are mid day meals our education infrastructure has vastly expanded from where we began back in 47 and we are the largest youth population in the world we have academics doctors engineers ceos spread all across the world representing our country and there are nations across the world who actually want to partner with india to as 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 a leading nation in Time. the future yeah so questions okay questions for arna muskan you spoke about the pledges in the midnight speech however when we see about inequality of opportunities still the wealth is majorly held by the like the top 1% of the population and the rest do suffer they are still poor so how do you want to substantiate that well well i mean yes uh, i do agree with what you said but um we have still been able to really come a long way because yes the 1% still owns the power definitely but we are still trying to you know reach the masses internet is available in all mostly all villages you know there is 5g is the cheapest data so we are trying yes the grassroots there are 
there are so many backgrounds but we it's not that yes it's been 75 years and we haven't been uh, it's like people the literacy rates have increased it's not that we haven't been able to um achieve anything but it's 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 gradual it's not it doesn't happen like this you know so thank you She used a very interesting line about uh, being the jewel in the crown. You know, personally, and I'm sure the judges have finished marking you, I'm not very enamored about this jewel thing. It brings glory only to the possessor and little joy to the jewel. And inevitably, every jewel is accompanied by a long background of devastation and environmental damage and so many other things, which is the condition India was left in when the British left, right? It had a nice jewel, but for us, all we had was a devastated country that had slipped from the first world economic power in the 1700s to a really, really poor third world space in 1947. So don't let this jewel thing fool you. Huh? The British say these things because they are a nation of shopkeepers. Don't let that fool you at all. Anyway, uh, Shayantika Biswas will speak against the motion from Sri Shikshayatan College. So. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone present here. I am Shayantika Biswas from Sri Shikshayatan College, and I am speaking against the motion. 76 years. 76 years have passed since Nehru pledged the sovereignty of the new India state. 76 years since he stayed, at the stroke of midnight hour when the world slips, India will awake to life and freedom. It is at this stroke of midnight that women are raped, sporadic violence on Dalits, Adivasis and minorities take place, freedom of speech is compromised and religious animosity takes place. Uh, 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 at the beginning of my argument, I would like to draw your attention on the increasing patriarchal onslaught that has been seen in the recent years. First, let's take the example of Hathra's gang rape case. On 14th September 2020, upper caste men were alleged to have raped a 19-year-old Dalit girl and UP police cremated the body at midnight without family's consent in order to hide the evidence. The incident was followed by the arrest of a Kerala journalist named Siddiqui Kapan and who tried to bring justice to this Hathras case. In the last month, the country was rocked to see the viral clip of two naked women being paraded on the streets. And that brings us to the Manipur violence. It is a religious animosity leading to the civil wars, a tension between the two communities that arose for land and public jobs. And incidents like this is not new in Manipur. Unrest was seen in 1970s and the loss of lives have continued since the last two decades. Human Rights Watch accused the government of Hindu majoritarianism and the caste violence in the organized religious framework. So this brings back me to the question, did India actually recover peace and strive for destiny as promised by Mehru in the pledge? The pledge promised that service of India means the service of millions who suffer. In spite of the support garnered by the Dalits, political support garnered by Dalits, they are still exposed to regular harassments. Institutional discrimination and social exclusion is very common to this community, uh, to this minority. UP and MP leading the charts for crime against SCs and STs. Violence against Dalit women have rose in the past few years, 16.8% for SC women and 26.7% for ST women. Exploitation of Dalit labor is also noticed, their working conditions akin to modern slavery. Low wages and high production pressure, exhaustingly long shifts and insufficient drinking water are some basic amenities that they are still deprived of. Nehru pledged that one world can no longer be split into isolated fragments. But the removal of Mughal dynasty from class 10 syllabus it itself contradicts this pledge. Um, India in the constitution decided to maintain principal distance between the state and religion. The line was maintained for the first few years, but it got blurry later when 
uh, when and Nehru tried to cover the communalism with the apparent political secularism. The pledge promised ending of poverty and inequality of opportunity. All the country talks about is youth, especially during the time of vote. But despite its demographic dividend, India faces youth unemployment as a major challenge of the labor market policy. According to the exports, 2 million graduates and a half a million postgraduate are still unemployed in India. Unemployment is the leading cause of brain drain in India, which is giving a brain gain to the West. And uh, the, the reason why West attra is attracting, uh, the West is attracting the high talents is because of the high employment rate and the pursuit of the higher education. Yeah. So uh, to conclude, we, we can say that Nehru's trace with destiny has no place in the modern India and it has been replaced by brutality and degeneration of humanity. Uh, thank you, uh, Shantika. But I think I don't know. The judges have noted that uh, you were reading your speech, and maybe that was not the right way to go. Yes, uh, Natasha, you have a question, please. Yeah. My question is that patriarchy is. Um, thank you. My question to you is: patriarchy is something which is not that it is particularly prevalent in these times, right? It is something which has been prevalent for a long point in time. So, what makes you think that? Uh, selective patriarchy is particularly affecting the pledge and not it, it it's like you're you're saying that patriarchy is something which is just existing during this time as if it does not exist at all so don't you think that india has come a long way as to have the conversation or the discourse around patriarchal society to begin with isn't that the fulfillment of the pledge see the conversation about the pet discourses of women have begun since the time uh, when Rahman Rai tried to bring, uh, tried to ban Sati, but the thing is, uh, did he include the woman during that time? No. So patriarchy was prevalent that time, but that was before independence. After independence, when men got the right to speak about their own rights, I think women should also have that space and platform to speak uh, uh, more about their rights. And uh, I think, like. The th like the rape cases that we have seen in the past few years are more heinous than what we have seen before. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please take your seat. Uh, Oritra Ganguly from Jadavpur University will propose the motion and uh, try to convince us that the pledges have been largely fulfilled. I'll start in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my firm belief that when people come to listen to a debate, they do not come with just the motive of having reached a final verdict at the end. They come with the motive of getting a more clear and nuanced view of a very particular question. So my question to you today is this. If before today's debate started, we were made by the honorable moderators to stand up in, in front of our seats and say, I pledge to provide the service of providing a clear and nuanced view of the motion by the end of this debate to every single one of the audience members. Unfortunately, we have uh, very, very few of those. So the members of the house. And again, at the end, the moderator uh, got up and said, uh, members of the house, do you think that the speakers have fulfilled their pledge? What do you think the answer would be like? Would it be a loud, resonating yes or no? Would it be something in between? What exactly are we looking for? Are we looking for a percentage? Uh, the motion today talks about largely fulfilled. Are we looking for a quantitative measure of, of exactly how fulfilled the pledges of midnight have been? The answer, I believe, is something slightly different. The fact that we have taken these pledges would have an amount of psychological impact on us. Uh, this was mentioned, and I will get to it. This psychological impact would make sure that we try to go to the ideal, we strive for the ideal of bringing about a clear and nuanced view of the motion. Not exactly, we wouldn't try to bring a, bring a balanced view, but we would try to uh, follow our own stances. The proposition would enhance their uh, view of it and the opposition would do the same. The audience's belief in us of informing them fully and of hearing this pledge and the speaker's action of actually taking this pledge in itself would increase the quality of debate. It wouldn't increase the quality, um, it wouldn't mean that we have fulfilled our service, uh, but it, would mean, uh, it wouldn't mean that we have fulfilled our service uh, in wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. Um, 
the midnight pledge what exactly was it if you go back and look and uh, read the actual constituent assembly debates uh, volume 5 i believe of the constituent assembly debates which are easily available on the internet you would see that the tryst with destiny the speech given by jawaharlal nehru one we are quoting time and again was not the actual pledge the pledge came uh, much later and it just talked about uh, talked about every single member of the constituent assembly dedicating themselves in the service of their nation that was it now i wouldn't go uh, i wouldn't narrow the scope of debate as we have already gone uh, a long way into it uh, by saying that this is something th this is the only thing we should debate about so uh, just just moments after jawaharlal nehru gave gave the famous to speech death in his speech uh, choudhry khaliquzaman another prominent member of uh, the constituent assembly and ironically a person uh, a popular leader of the all india muslim league who a few years later we went off to pakistan because uh, jinnah did not like the uh, like the policies of india he got up and said um, and i will quote to you the exact uh, statement uh, he said that he thinks that he thinks that a pledge formally administers leads some uh, psychological effect on the mind of every person now ladies and gentlemen the pledges of midnight did not contain uh, contain any particular concrete problems the members taking the pledge uh, assigned and embedded their own issues in it the people speaking on the day radha krishnan uh, khalikul zaman nehru they all took the pledge and slightly made it their own by embedding issues in it not verbally or explicitly but in a much more important much more effective way in their own minds and that is how they went towards it communal tension poverty and hunger uh, inequality of opportunity these were all things alluded to in those debates these things have come a long way absolutely they do exist today absolutely they do exist in a very uh, significant manner but compare it to the scale of 1947 and you will see that the uh, pledges of 1947 were never meant to be completely fulfilled it was always meant to be largely fulfilled and it always will be largely fulfilled by our future leaders thank you so much thank you so much um, you know when they say pledge themselves to the service of the nation i think it's something should that should be read out to the politicians of today you know service of and there exists the large question mark personal opinion of course not trying to influence the judges anyway who has a question for aritro hey hi um so my question to you is very simple right you as a debater would come up here and tell us that look promises have largely been fulfilled the pledges which have been made have largely been fulfilled when you are coming in here and explain to us that look every single pledge made was personalized with their own bias right these were promises these were pledges which were used to motivate these were never seen through in any circumstances right we as side opposition tell you that look these are things which have not been seen through these are conceptualized but these have not been institutional you know kind of made into the institution so how do you defend that number one they have been seen through to in quite a large extent that i mentioned the extent of which uh, with which these issues existed back then and with, with which they exist right now the pledges it was a singular statement it just said that they dedicate themselves in the service of their nation and hope for world peace and prosperity of uh, human welfare and the prosperity of mankind what i say is every single person these are human beings sitting in the constituent assembly these are human beings trying to do well for their country they have to assign some particular issues to it if they want to have a pragmatic practical real impact they have to select some issues and work towards it and that is exactly what they did and that is exactly what it they largely succeeded in thank you thank you aritro ekolopo ready okay and that's akolopo from jadavpur university speaking against the motion draft uh, the honorable good afternoon members of the house today i'll be speaking against the motion my argument will be divided into three segments the first one dealing with the pledges what they were what did they promise the immediate context of it secondly explaining why i believe they haven't been fulfilled and th thirdly explaining the causality behind the non fulfillment well as my fellow speaker of proposition has rightfully explained that the pledges of the midnight and let me allow to do so that they go beyond the tryst with destiny speech it was an exact pledge which pledged three things one the members of the constituent assembly pledged to dedicate themselves in all humility to the service of the india and her people so that the ancient land of india can attain the rightful place in the world and thus make her full and willing contribution to the promotion of world peace and the welfare of mankind 
these understandings of world peace welfare of mankind rightful place in the entire world these are ever changing evolution like concepts in evolution we need to understand that the socio political context in which the pledges were made and the tryst with destiny speech was delivered were dark times there was the partition the violence that come came with it there were extreme cases of horror in terms of social fabric there were communal clashes and in instead of solving that on part of the statesmen they were left dumbfounded and confused what we also saw was an extreme case of inequality and they were in turn reflected in the concerns which were made by nehru in his speech therefore the context informs the pledge and the realities in which india was at that time as the realities have evolved with time we come today various members of the proposition have argued how we have had such beautiful and uh, celebrations which achievements which deserve celebration well they have spoken about inequality and how we have largely eradicated it they have spoken about literacy they have spoken about uh, eradication of corruption they have also spoken about communal clashes and the nature of it and how they have evolved well we can witness right now that something like the universal adult franchise which have been mentioned repeatedly by speakers of the proposition it has not attained absolute fulfillment because the question of security always rises while i cannot uh, while i am not denying the achievement of the universal adult franchise i cannot also ignore that my location in the state of west bengal has recently witnessed how villages of people men women individuals belonging to the lgbtq communities were restricted from exercising their right to vote were not allowed to go to polling uh, polling centers the vote booths and were repeatedly inflicted with horror violence and grotesque nature of human behavior the nature of this dissonance why is does it exist while several members of proposition have argued in way and perhaps will argue is the nature of the dynamism through which india has come through 75 years is a long time and therefore these unfulfilled pledges are not necessarily unfulfilled in the greater sense the dynamism perhaps has helped them to reinterpret well to activate the interpretive potential does not mean to interrogate or reject the core fundamental basis the ideological construct of those pledges while india has witnessed severe challenges that nehru couldn't have predicted back then in 1947 like the 1962 attack by china the 1975s emergency the 1984 anti sikh riots the liberalization of indian economy in 1991 the political turmoil which started uh, in the 1990s and the communal clashes which ensued after them we have to realize that different generations of indians have elected different generations of leaders and we live in a representative democracy so the fulfillment of the pledges are the responsibility of these representatives who have been sent to the parliament the lok sabha and the rajya sabha and they have gravely failed in interpreting the pledges in the rightful sense of the pledges as they existed therefore i'd like to end my arguments by suggesting that the midnight pledge has been failed not only just not fulfilled because we do not regret the loss of an erwin ideal but we regret how it has been lost in the sense of repeated political reinterpretations thank you not just not fulfilled but actually failed strong words you have a question please ask he has a mic for you uh, you mentioned the whole uh, Uh, you mentioned the whole case of people not being able to vote in i think the recent elections or whatever in the Neher, in nehru speech or rather in those pledges he ensured that legally or from the government side every can everyone can vote whereas the repercussions of the voting violence all of that that happened today uh, wasn't really something that either a, he could have uh, predicted or the pledge actually covers so how do you maintain that uh, correlation between those two issues uh, right thank you for your question that's why i mentioned the interpretive potential of the pledges the pledges and their reception nehru pledged and it was the responsibility of successive generations of political leaders to interpret them in the right sense so while nehru couldn't have predicted the political violence of west bengal in 2023 it's what's the responsibility of successive generation of national and state leaders to ensure the security and en- guarantee that each and every individual in the state holding a voter card can exercise their universal adult franchise rights thank you akulabbo the interpretative potential of pledges i'm sure nobody could have predicted the violence of 2023 in 1947 but 
at the same time doesn't it make you wonder standing in the middle of all the communal riots of partition if he did not understand the potential for violence in the indian people True. just a thought just a thought because we were not just born at midnight we were born amidst unbelievable violence very few nations have been born with so much violence uh, at that moment of birth since a years call but at the same time uh, i have heard from my father and from my seniors that till the night of the afternoon of the 14th the widespread violence in belaghata and in raja bazar was replaced at dawn on the 15th by unbelievable celebrations of unity and exchange of goodwill when people realized that you know now that independence has come any violence is the harm that we do to ourselves not to anybody else so that's also a fact of history how you interpret it is entirely up to you sensevia's college kolkata abhishek chobe who's been an enthusiastic interjector in this debate so abhishek let's hear you speak now my speech starts in 3 2 1 at the stroke of the midnight hour when the world sleeps india will rise to life and freedom quoting a trash with destiny by pandit jawaharlal nehru ji a very good afternoon to the esteemed panel of judges dignitaries and members of the house i am abhishek chobe from sensevia's college and i firmly stand for the nation and not just the motion the iconic midnight hour speech by pandit ji is one of the most eloquent and powerful speeches in the history of mankind politicians from all over the world quote his speech because they feel that this particular speech has an element of freedom and power now before we move ahead it is very important for us to know what are these pledges that we are talking about the first one the pledge to the service of the nation and to the humanities let's talk about service to the nation we all are doing national duty from right from the personnel who's posted on the siachen border to the mothers who you know nurture us the leaders of tomorrow to the old people who guide us to the people who clean the gardens for us to anyone and everyone to the children who do kind acts like plantation drives everyone is doing national duty and i feel that we haven't failed an inch to you know succeed in our pledges and now talking about service to humanity let me remind you that india is one of those countries that has provided free vaccines to 101 countries including our neighbor pakistan ladies and gentlemen we are indians our heart bleeds we cry when we see someone in pain and so we believe that because of this mankind the pledges of the midnight are that talk about service to nation and humanity have largely been fulfilled and now a quotation for you all so i'm quoting this service to india means service to millions who suffer it means the ending of poverty ignorance disease and inequality of opportunity yes of course side opposition the critics would like to say that did it end for all a very important important question no it didn't end for all the slavery which we were for the last 200 years you can't be expected to win in 75 years even if you say that 75 years were sufficient i would say they are not but it doesn't mean that we are not working on it we are on the roads to success not all roads are smooth and not all journeys are swift ladies and gentlemen good things take time so we need a little time to cover up the gray areas and i believe that we would win this and now talking about poverty i would like to quote some statistics from the world bank according to the world bank extreme poverty has reduced from you know uh, 22.5% to 10.2% in 2011 to 2019 so we have seen a downward shift in the poverty line and do you not feel that this is an important question that makes the pledges of the midnight hour a huge a grand success now talking about ignorance and discrimination quoting article 15 of the indian constitution for you the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them what i just quoted ladies and gentlemen talks about reservations and when we talk about reservations we have to notice that we have tried our level best so that you know this the problem of uh, inequality can be curbed to a great extent to a large extent and now about the diseases as mentioned earlier india is one of those countries to tackle huge diseases like polio smallpox etc the pledges of the midnight hour are very important because the britishers had broken the spine of this nation dividing into gender key, key, caste whatever the irony is once who ruled us for 200 years are now being ruled for us ruled by us ladies and gentlemen you got me right we are talking about rishi sunak the prime minister of united kingdom 
who's now ruling the 10 Downing Street. Ladies and gentlemen, we have made our own laws and now we are replacing the IPC, the CRPC, the Indian Evidence Act very soon. This makes us a grand success and we will say the pledges of the midnight hour will be a large success. They said that their sun never sets. Now I, Abhishek Chaube, tell you that our sun would never set. So this was all from my side. A very happy Independence Day in advance. Jai Hind. I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, sir, you talk about Rishi Sunak, right? You have to understand that Rishi Sunak is, is as English as the Kohinoor diamond or as Indian as Victoria Memorial, right? Considering you talk about the bravery of Rishi Sunak, who belongs to the, one of the richest British families, you talk about that as an achievement of India. That is rather the failure of India. Why? Because you talk about success from those who you don't even belong to. You talk about success of your colonizers. So standing on the lines and foundations of colonizers, I think it's a very weird stance you pull for, you know, proposition. Okay. So uh, Rishi Sunak is of Indian origin. Of course, if you know that one of his parents is from Punjab, so, in fact, it is an achievement for us because someone who ruled me for 200 years is now being, you know, I won't say ruled, but under, you know, some Indian. So, this is an achievement. Now, I am, you know, they said on the red roads that Indians and dogs are not allowed. Do you know this, sir? Now, I would like to say that they said that their sun never sets. Rishi Sunak has made it a point to, you know, just reincarnate the entire situation by saying that now India's sun would never set. And I am quoting Rishi Sunak because one of his parents is of India. And if you have a little bit knowledge about tax, if any one of the parent or immediate grandparents is of the Indian origin, that makes the person related to India. So this was from the Income Tax Act 1961. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek Chobe. And uh, I liked your reference to the IRPC and the Indian Penal Code, the amendment, CRPC and the Indian Penal Code that you brought in. Uh, that's a new dimension that we are still, at the 75th year at least, we are trying to shed some colonial era laws. Uh, I just wondered why it took so long. Uh, Muskan Agarwal, you are speaking against the motion. No more jokes on Rishi Sunak. Huh? <laughs> He's not here and. Uh, Okay, I'll be starting in three, two, one. It is rightly said that a minute is enough to bring about a change. But then even after 76 years of independence, we have still not completely fulfilled the pledges which were made by our founding members in the, on the day of independence. Today, I, Ms. Kana Garwal, proudly stand to oppose the motion at hand. We know that Independence Day is tomorrow and we'll be celebrating the 76th Independence Day. But do you really think that it calls for a celebration? I'll be firstly highlighting few of the pledges by our founding members and then I'll just prove that how they are not yet completely or largely fulfilled. The Trust with Destiny highlighted the pledges of taking up responsibility to end poverty, ignorance, disease and inequality of opportunities. However, it is a sad reality that we are a country where 30 farmers die every day by suicide. Are they in peace? No. How is the pledge of to strive to wipe every tear from every eye largely fulfilled then? They spoke about freedom and peace. But don't you know about the unprecedented violence that affected students in major universities, be it, Delhi, be it Hyderabad University, be it universities in Delhi and so on. Take the simple case of university in Delhi, Jamia Millia University, where police, yes, you heard me correct, police who are supposed to uh, protect us from violence and injustice, drag students from libraries. This is not justice. This is not what happened even in the British era. So ir ironically, we talk about fulfillment of freedom and peace, but we still have not attained it. My fellow opposition team members have spoken already about caste violence and, you know, violence against women. They are no uh, different. We even see changes in history books affecting student brains in schools. These are not uh, coinciding what, uh, with what democracy is. We even see freedom of press is under major attacks these days. Why? Because government is interfering in freedom of press. 
we even see that uh, the cbfc has become drastically regressive with granting certificates to films that are supposed to be a mirror to the society who should be blamed we will be blaming one another this is what political parties do right political parties are involving in destructive uh, in destructive criticism they are involving themselves in blame games which were not supposed to uh, which was not supposed to be happening according to the pledges which were taken by jawaharlal nehru on the way here i saw four five children begging around me and we speak about poverty rates we can please understand we cannot ignore what is happening around us we still see poor people around us we cannot talk about the top 1% of the population who have the, uh, amassed the wealth of the nation still the last 40% of the population are below poverty line not below poverty line they are holding only 3% of the wealth rich are getting richer poor are getting poorer extreme inequality still prevail in the society speaking about an ignorance india was considered the second most ignorant nation in the recent data my fellow participants have spoken about green revolution but do you know about the case of punjab which was considered the ground zero of green revolution people have suffered suicide rates uh people have suffered uh, increasing societal rates by over 12 times in the last 5 years in punjab so how can we speak about peace freedom and whatever was mentioned india ranks 107th in the global hunger index which means food which is a basic necessity is still a problem inflation is still a persistent problem india is still ranking 6th amongst the countries with the worst air quality index which is indirectly not fulfilling the uh, pledges which were meant to be fulfilled by the uh, founding members i would just like to sum up my speech by stating that we have still not largely fulfilled them fulfilled our pledges which are inequality in opportunities ignorance poverty disease and freedom from bias to sum up we have developed but not our holistically time, yes. we have studied but not all we are not all of us have become wise thank you so much proud to oppose yes uh, so aritro yeah the last question you asked so i must um my question is very simple do you do you believe that it would be fair to give a quantitative measure to just how much uh, it uh, just how much it has not been fulfilled and do you, uh, could you give us a sense of that measure yeah as you spoke about quantitative measure even in your speech and the question however if we do not quantify our measures how are we supposed to measure them we cannot just go about psychologically proving statements that yes because their pledges were taken up so we will be doing it we are not doing it and stats are proving it so yes thank you you were expecting a number want to guess a number he was expecting a number uh Oh, I'm so sorry. No, like he says, how much of it has been fulfilled? Fifty percent for I mean, he's a number cruncher, being an economic student. So okay, again, me also being an economic student, I do not think that I That's can. That's the dialogue. Yeah. So I cannot. I do not think that we can give a certain number to every sector because every sector has developed in a different manner. For instance, literacy rate has increased by seventy-four okay, percent. However, other rates have not. so yes okay. maybe 10 20% thank you you work on a model huh number weightage huh and evolutionary time scale so uh, then we have now come to the last team in this afternoon's debate and that's the department of law university of calcutta proposing the motion is natasha aziz can i allow to keep my own time huh? yeah absolutely but you can trust us is a very nice good time keeper very strict also okay uh, am i audible okay are we starting in 3 2 1 so firstly the debate today is not about which party was able to fulfill the pledge more or which party was able to fulfill the pledge less but rather about all the four institutions or rather the pillars of democracy so called combined with the people of india and the representatives together whether they have been able to even substantially fulfill right there is a word used here which is largely which sets a comparative right so on the burden on side opposition is to full is to tell us that there has been absolute zero 
fulfillment of the pledges that we had taken and where, whereas on side proposition if we are able to give them that there has been at least some fulfillment then we take the debate from them right so we have three arguments here that apart apart from the qualitative measures and apart from the usual quantitative measures as to how much we have been able to give uh, like live up to the pledge to examine that whether we take this debate or not first we are standing here like why are we celebrating this india is the leader of global g20 currently right 76 years back, people could not imagine a country like India to take the leadership. But here we are taking the leadership and actually telling people that, look, your Eurocentric con concerns of talking about the Russia-Ukraine war needs to stop because now let us focus on climate change and climate action and climate financing because that is what is impacting the global south the most. Therefore, India's role as the leader of the global south becomes even more pertinent here and which is why it goes ahead and does, you know, voice its concern as to how it's going to deal with all of the problems which particularly affect the countries of the global south. Now, secondly, talking about social justice, which has come up time and again in this debate. Understand the problem is not with the fact that casteism still exists. Yes, it's going to exist even 50 years down the line. But the problem that you are, the very fact that you are identifying or having a discourse or realizing that yes, caste-based violence is wrong or that if a particular gender is discriminated is wrong or that a particular community is discriminated is wrong is something worth a progress is something worth fulfilling a pledge secondly when you talk about things like you know marginalized communities have been discriminated and no action being taken understand that even if governmental or institutions having have, have uh, failed we still have non-governmental organizations like the idr the vidhi policy and all of them taking the actions by conducting data research and actually in uh, uh, including the people of the tribal community include uh, in their research to make to actually corroborate the reality that is there and through criminal justice litigation they are ensuring that these people are represented these people are given the chance to at least voice their concern right so that is if that is not fulfillment of the pledge i don't know what it is third when you talk about fulfillment of the pledge largely you accuse us of you know things like communal violence understand communal violence is not something which has existed suddenly which has popped up yes maybe after a certain tenure it has you have seen more of it but in different realms of Indian history, you are still going to see communal violence. But your metric of measuring whether we have come along, we are not, is by identifying the fact that how a government is choosing to respond to a communal violence and where what is the reaction of the people. If the people are reacting in a compassionate manner to the marginalized community, then in itself is something that you have pledged, and in itself the pledge has been fulfilled, and we, uh, the side proposition has taken the case. With that, very proud to propose the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Oh, I have 30 seconds left. Yeah. May I take the 30 seconds? Trust please? Our time or never yours. No, I was not looking. Can I please take 30 seconds if that's okay? Uh, we, if the opposition agrees, uh, can she have 30 seconds more, please? Yes. Go Thank right you. ahead. Thank you. No, she fulfilled, did not fulfill her pledge for four minutes. 30 seconds yes. to go. Okay. Fulfill it. Okay, so going back to where I was, things about somebody stated in the audience that uh, reservation is something which exacerbates the condition of the ca uh, casteist uh, discrimination that exists. Understand that these people need a safety net. When we recognize that there is a need for this safety net, when we recognize that despite all of the communal or the racist or the casteist remarks existing, if there are only so a few group of people who are identifying this as something which is wrong, them being them understanding the representatives of this. People people understanding is still the pledge fulfilled and we think that we have won the case there. Thank you. Four minutes fulfilled. Yes. 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 Sorry. I just have a simple question. You spoke about a lot of things, but do you really think that Indians are given equal opportunities right now, like more or less? Okay, so the thing is not about equality, it's about equity, right? At the end of the day, we think that yes, however opportunities are given to us, it won't be enough. And we will need to have, we'll always have a metric of comparing ourselves with someone else in order to see that where we lack in terms of that, right? So in that case point in time, here it becomes a metric to look back what the status, for example, the status of women was back 50 years back. Probably my mother could not, my grandmother could not imagine coming up here and talking about her rights. But if somebody today tells me that, no, you are not allowed to work after a certain hour, I will start questioning that person. And that in itself is something like, you know, the concept of equality existing. 
So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad that as a young lawyer, you've reconciled yourself to long hours. Please take your seat. Uh, Another question. Why? No, there's no, no question. Uh, it's not on table. Yeah, yeah, like sure, sure. Question. Uh. So my question to you is, I mean, he, he can't put down the book. <laughs> so my question to you is very simple, OK? India trying to host the G20 summit to address climate change and ignore the Russia and Ukrainian conflict is kind of your answer to casteism still existing and issuing that it is wrong, right? But not addressing it and not trying to mitigate things because you are still ignoring things as things are, right? So what's your stance? Okay. So this is a viewer's <laughs> choice question. This uh, is a viewer's because choice. Because she's answered yeah. a statutory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So firstly, I think that in terms of if you look at casteism, I mean, you the, if you may like hear the words and it is Eurocentric, right? Essentially, when we look at world politics as a whole, it has been very Eurocentric in nature, right? So my co my comparison here was 76 years back, people would not have considered India for a leadership role, but here they are today considering, and that in itself is a shift from the global leaders being Euro, essentially Eurocentric leaders or the global leaders being uh, you know white countries and them concern like citing those concerns when you talk about the issue of casteism I think it's very some, something which is very unique to India right so at the end of the day how India chooses to mitigate casteism how India chooses to deal with the policies of uh, policies related to casteism is something which is unique to it so both of them are unrelated I don't know why you made an equation between them This is all viewer's choice. It's indication of your popularity. <laughs> okay. Uh, the last quick speaker in today's debate, and somebody who really deserves a round of applause, is Nilanjan Bose. And Nilanjan has been sitting patiently, going through all these speeches. He has not asked a question, which indicates maybe he's a little nervous. But Nilanjan, over to you. Persuade us that the pledges made have not been fulfilled. Not largely, not largely been fulfilled. You know, so many adverbs, I'm getting a little confused now. I'm audible. So, yeah, I'm also timing myself, but hopefully I'm not 30 seconds short. Yeah, and I would also like uh, viewers questions, if possible, no, 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 if there's no, time. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. So I'm starting in three, two, and one. Time is not measured by passing of the years, but by what one does, what one feels, and what one achieves, right? And this quote by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru is kind of apt as we look back in the 75 years which we have been through to our independence, right? And when we talk about this motion, we have to understand where does the delta of this motion rise. The delta of this motion does not lie in absolute failure or tremendous success, right? It rise somewhere in the middle and we have to categorize it whether it kind of to some extent delivers on the largely said category, right? And to quote again, it has been quoted like over again and again, to quote Jawaharlal Nehru, not wholly or, or in full measure, but very substantially. So the question then arises, what is the metric of this substantial fulfillment? What is this metric? And by what metric do the side government comes and tell us that it has been fulfilled? Because what we have got so far are examples versus examples. Side proposition has given me a lot of examples. Opposition has given me a lot of examples. Why should these examples count? Why should this example necessarily fulfill the criteria, the metric of substantial fulfillment has not been clarified by side, uh, side proposition, right? So let me tell you how can we, what is the metric of this substantial fulfillment should look like? on three grounds, right? What are these three grounds? First of all, the time period India had access to, which is a quarter of a century. So the time period India could utilize to go towards this fulfillment, to go towards this goal. The second metric is the challenges faced and the opportunities which India had access to. And this could look like something like globalization and information technology, which India now had access to and it could actually grow and actually go towards those goals, right? Which wouldn't have been possible when the 200 years British were ruling. So this comparison which side proposition comes up and tell us the 200 years of British were ruling and only 75 years we have got through, that is not a fair comparison because understand the challenges face and opportunities we had are not the same. But also, the, what's the third metric, right? The third metric is a comparative of how it holds up against other countries, right? So when we tell you that, you know, India got independence in 1947, 
there are also other upcoming countries coming up, right? Japan has just been nuked. There was a new communist regime in China. There was, uh, after many years, I think, Sing Singapore got their independence. And then after like 20, uh, 22 years, 25 years or so, uh, 24 years, sorry, the Bangladesh got their independence, right? So the question then becomes, then what, how do we draw this substantial fulfillment? And side propositions argue that it has to draw, uh, side oppositions argue that it has to draw a comparative. That is, where does Japan, after being nuked, where does it uh, stand in chance with India, right? Where does this country, which got its independence much after, such as Bangladesh, it is also going ahead and actually doing better in terms of healthcare metrics, in terms of educational metrics, even in terms of GDP per capita, right? So that has to be that comparative by which we determine this substantial fulfillment, right? So again, the side proposition will come up with many examples and there are counter examples which we come up with, right? When you talk about equality of opportunity, equality of opportunity and justice which has been point pointed out over and over again. As a law student, I would like to mention that we have over 55 crore cases in the judicial system in general. We have over 60 lakh cases in high courts and 60,000 in Supreme Court, right? People do not have access to even approach the courts because either they don't know the laws, they are ignorant about the laws, they do not have the financial mechanism to go approach the courts, they do not have the legal aid, right? At that point in time, where you cannot even approach the law of the land for justice, where does this equality of opportunity lies, right? 63 million ordinary Indians are pushed into poverty because of healthcare costs every single year. That is two people every second. I would like to point out, as we go, as we talk about this entire issue, somebody, and a uh, trigger alert, somebody is getting probably sexually assaulted across this country. A part of our country is probably getting burned, people are being padded na naked. And that is why we come here and tell you that it is very important that we talk about it in this context. Any questions? Yeah. You have more than your quota of whatever choices you want to make. But you haven't asked a question, so you will have the primary question, and then we'll come to... Okay, so my question to you is that you say time, what I understood, time may not be a big factor. We should not compare the two timing. But don't you think if we are too hurried with the development process, right now you think that majority of the resources are with the uh, very few people. So more, the quicker the development, more this inequality increases. So right now we are not in a race. We are not comparing, we are in, not in a race. We are rather in a marathon. So to take so many people together, we need to, uh, we need to take more and more time. So time is an important factor, address that. First of all, I talk about three metrics. One is the time period by which India has got independence. The second is the challenges and opportunities faced. That is why time comparison may not be a good metric. And the third is obviously in com it in being comparison with other countries. Now, in your question of time in itself, we think time is a very important metric, right? Because I do not think that a person who's getting discriminated right now in India can wait for 200, 300 years because they do not have that category, right? So we tell you that time is a very critical metric by which we judge because it wouldn't have been the same in India if we had 750 years versus 75 years. And that is the substantial metric which we talk about. Substantial metric has to be judged by the time period had India had had access to, the kind of challenges it faced and opportunities it had, and what other countries could do at that point in time, which we could not. And that is why we come here and tell you that we have not been able to fulfill those pledges because other countries which have been nuked, other countries which have got their independence much later, have been able to fulfill their pledges where we couldn't, and that is why it has not been substantial. Okay. Mr. Raman, Mr. Bhattacharya, we have time for a couple of more questions. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Or it's true? All right, this is going to be a viewer's choice length question as well. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, the three metrics you mentioned are time, challenges, and opportunities uh, given to India, faced by India, and the third is other countries and what they have done. Now, you say that uh, you more or less talk about how these three metrics determine how developed we have become, how far we have gotten in the story of our growth. Is that or is that not true? Uh, I say it is a metric for categorizing the substantial fulfillment, whether it has been substantial or not. Okay, so two questions here. Number one, you do not account for the internal nature of the country. You've, you've talked about time, challenges, and opportunities, other countries, three external factors. There is no talk about how internal measures in the country, how uh, which leaders we have, uh, how they go about approaching solutions to the problems. Uh, the, you do not account for that. And number two is you talk about how these metrics, uh, talk, you talk about how these metrics go towards a certain quantitative, if I, if I may, quantitative substantiation of how far we have reached, where ex exactly have we reached that? 
Okay, on those two points, first of all, we are here to judge those people who have been in power and who have led this country, right? So when we talk about India as a country going forward, we always take into account the external factors it had. And if there were somebody within this country or a particular group of people or party or so to say, which has not been able to develop this country, that is within the ambit of this debate, which is to say that that is within the idea of India having been not being able to substantially develop, right? Whereas when we take talk about external factors, that is something which might take into consideration when we talk about this substantial metric. Hope I hope that answers your question, right? Does that answer your first question? I, I have the second question which I need to answer. Huh? The second question. The second yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The second part on was on the numbers, right? Numbers do matter a lot. We have every year some kind of numbers coming up from the government on women's health, on nutrition. We have all these rankings coming up. These rankings of where does India was in democracy index two years back and where is it now? Where does space freedom index rise? So yes, we can actually, like to certain extent, it's complicated, but we can actually put it into numbers to get some idea of where, did, where we were and where we are right now. It's not perfect, but it can be done. I have a much simpler question. It's that uh, you invalidate our arguments by saying on the full case of the growth that the country has experienced, by saying that there are different opportunities of harm in 200 years as opposed to growth in the 70 countries, right? And then again, you come ahead and say that countries that gained independence along with us, like China or Singapore, they are uh, way ahead of us because of, again, better opportunities. So isn't that a sort of cherry picking and double standards that you get ahead of? Uh, argue against that whole opportunity argument. No, see, I say that all those three factors should be categorized into the substantial fulfillment part, right? So when I talk about that, when we compare our, ourselves with other countries, understand India does not have the same kind of demography as China does, right? India is not a tiny country like Singapore, right? So we cannot actually compare us to full extent with other countries, so as to say. But we must take into account those factors, that is the challenges faced in, within India and so as to say from outside India, and the opportunity we have such as globalization and information technology, right? And secondly, when we have to also draw comparative, just because Singapore is a single island does not negate the fact that we must not ever compare ourselves with India, what they did right and what they did wrong. So I think all of those three factors, the time period we have, the challenges and opportunities we had, and the comparative of us with other countries, all those should be taken into account when we talk about substantial fulfillment, and we have failed because other countries have done better. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjan. Any more? Back now. This is like an overkill. He'll feel persecuted if you carry on like this. <laughs> I mean, if the moderators are okay, I'm fine. Since we have a little bit of luxury of time, well, the results, yeah. But make it a short question, huh? No three part long question. Huh? That's very unfair on this. Uh, do you agree that uh, the pledges taken on midnight were simply to, uh, simply uh, of the members of the Constituent Assembly to dedicate themselves in the service of the country? No, because on that pledge there was very specific metrics which are talked about. They were talking about poverty, they were talking about ignorance, they were talking about diseases, right? So these were the metrics they pushed forward as compared to other metrics which was not mentioned. So a generalized category is something which we can never achieve because we don't know what we are going forward with, right? And we are talking about those specific pledges, so as to say. Thank you. At Please two. take your seat. Okay. Seat. I think our next debate should be on Independence Day and Republic Day, which is more relevant for this nation. Uh, because uh, one of the things in this debate was that some of the issues were confused. Some of the issues that came up through the events connected to the 26th of January were actually discussed as part of Nehru's Pledge with Destiny. But nonetheless, as I said at the beginning of this debate, there is much that we should be, we can be proud of. Not very many third world underdeveloped nations have given liberation to another country. Not very many third world gen countries have today a population that is three and a half times larger than the population at independence. And this population is only the higher income group in this country. So if you look at it, we've pulled out all the people of India who existed on the 15th of August, 1947, and given each one a family of three, 
and place them in the higher bracket of income globally. So that's not a mean achievement for a country. Whoever, anybody can take credit for it, but you know, it's not a mean achievement. And finally, this is also a country which has this incredible compromise, said Priyam, but I would say an ability to take a course and then correct its course. In, for a substantial period of my 75 years, and this is my field of work, we built the public sector, for example, into the commanding heights of the economy. And today we are in a mood where in the 21st century capitalist milieu, we are privatizing them. Each of these privatizations, the substantial ones, are fetching as much money for the people of this country as the first five years of the union budget. From 1947 to 1952, our budget size was smaller than the sale price of Air India. That was the union budget size. That's not bad for a country to attain this level of economic prowess. True, we cannot imagine life today, today without private insurance, private banking, private airlines, private telecom, private just about everything. But it's also a measure that we cannot imagine life without an LIC. We cannot imagine life without a State Bank of India. We cannot imagine life without an Airports Authority of India. We cannot imagine life without the backbone of BSNL and the telephone department carrying internet across this country. So despite the extremely um, non-pledge-like contributions in our, to our national narrative of communal riots and uh, ethnic cleansing and purging, we have to admit that the pledges that were made at midnight have been fulfilled, but largely is the problem here. The largely will be de determined by the judges, not by me, thank God for that. And uh, with these few words, back to you. And Mr. Kumar, you have been sitting so quietly at the back. Uh, you know, uh, may we welcome Mr. Kumar, the current curator and director of the Victoria Memorial Hall, a man of science who is now ruling an institution at the head of an institution that represents heritage, not just in this city, but for many, many Indians. I, um, the judges have done their very difficult work and I do have in my hands, it's not see-through, right, okay, uh, the results of the debate, but before we finally disclose that, I would like to invite Mr. Samarindra Kumar, the secretary and curator of the Victoria Memorial Hall to uh, say the closing remarks. Mr. Kumar, please. So, good evening to all of you, the moderator, Mr. Guptuji, all the judges who are there, and all the participants uh, without which this program could not have been successful. So, I was listening to the judges, I think some of the judges, I listened to that, and also the moderator, what he spoke to that. I think that was a very interesting topic which we selected for this year's uh, event on the occasion of our Independence Day. And uh, I could not listen to all the uh, participants because uh, of some other, you know, uh, it's being running two different institutions is a very, little bit difficult for me. But I think what I uh, 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 guess from the talk which our judges have told, that it was a very engaging, engaging debate uh, for all of us. I think uh, that's very important uh, because uh, the topic itself is so, I mean, uh, so thought-provoking. Uh, and especially for the young generation who have seen, uh, not seen the prior, maybe in 50s, 60s or like that. For us also it is somewhat very interesting topic. I remember um, uh, we have done some exhibitions because in CSM, uh, I'm also looking after National Council of Science Museums of Science City and Birla Museum are part of that. So I'm uh, associated with that. And we have done some exhibition which was connected with the history of India. So one exhibition was there, uh, which was called United India on Sardar Patel. And if you see the real history of that, that uh, after the independence, how the in integration of things will happen, probably you will, uh, I mean, uh, probably those history was not there available uh, in, uh, probably I was also not knowing, but we did dig deep into that. You came to know that how and uh, what are the reasons and so many things has come across uh, uh, after so many years. And probably that is also probably one of the reasons, probably on f 1947, 
that was the time when when lot of princely states were there lot of other things were there the the people were had gone through such a difficult times especially the partitions other things so at that time the speech should have be was probably a made for an audience which was just bubbling with energy on that particular day and many things would have to come because so many things the constitution was also not there which would define the uh, i mean the duties responsibilities of the government uh, every, all uh, people together so i think that was also very important in which context the uh, the uh, nehru speech was given and then later on how the aspirations and other things have changed we rightly said that the aspirations of people at that time was somewhat different but the young generation which is coming in maybe in the later past 80s 90s millenniums and whatever you call them their aspirations and the people those who are seeing today and those who will see in future maybe another 25 30 years where they want to place india where they want to see india that is totally changing i mean and it will change also with the time i think a lot of you have put debate that these schemes are the things we are not going to debate that quantitative things are not there but how much qualitatively it has improved that has to be also seen that the kind of uh, the the image what we are having today uh, personally i will feel that because i have traveled to so many countries i have seen that in present times when you go abroad you will see the difference in fact you have seen with indian passport how you are treated that i have seen and it is very clearly visible so that is kind of thing we feel pride for that that when you are traveling when you are uh, talking to people across that i am involved with several international projects also and then we see the kind of voice which is heard from india in fact and probably at many places it is uh, very well recognized people like you when you are going in you will go for some uh, higher studies everywhere uh, the lot of things will come but i think that is very important that how you place india now and where you want to see india from this place space we are talking about that nobody can match india in that digital thing probably india is going to be there because a lot of missions are going on which will place in another 10 to 15 years india in that position where probably nobody will match with that because we have that resources with us we have that resources and probably the focus is also because the long term planning is going in that way in many places because i discussed with seven ministries also the long term planning for keeping india 10 to 15 years from now probably that is going to change and uh, uh, you will see the uh, i mean effect maybe another 10 15 years from now how we are going to see india in different way it's going to be definitely it's uh, something very exciting for us probably it will be because we'll be in 80s at that time but for you probably it will be a very exciting change and uh, uh, i think we should witness that kind of change our young generation can witness that kind of change and we should be feel proud i think uh, i will not go into the detail whether it is largely been fulfilled or not fully like that but i think the most important part is that it was engaging uh, discussion all of you have uh, uh, given your deliberation i think now it's the time for judges i thank you all of you uh, for being part of this today's uh, discussion thanks uh, to mr guptu and all the judges for sparing their valuable time for coming to this place and best wishes to all the participants because i don't know i think the results are there so it is very important that so all the best to all of you thank you thank you for coming to vmh do come take part in that uh, we are also opening up because uh, we had some exhibitions our new uh, uh, sign uh, light and sound show has opened calcutta city of joy some more uh, new exciting exhibitions are coming up in 2 3 months time so we wish that you come uh, with friends families to this uh, one of the largest uh, 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 museum visitors in the in fact asia pacific region and maybe in, in india. india is definitely number 1 but probably uh, maybe in third or fourth in the league now coming last year we had 3.4 million the tta in, uh, uh, in uh, london had only 2.2 million or so so we are we are in that level so i think with uh, patronage of young people like that it will increase in that way thank you thank you very much i was a miss one should also thank the time keeper he's done a valiant job yeah thank He you should. thank you uh, i miss that the whole team and also thank to the technical team our education team and all people involved in conduct this program thank you thank you so much mr kumar um okay uh, so i have the results i just forgot i just wanted to mention that 
I remember uh, uh, during some uh, some uh, program as such that why uh, after the independence when Nehru was going to villages and uh, talking to the villagers, actually he was discussing foreign policy to a great extent to a villager who is also not able to fill his, uh, I mean, uh, uh, family, feed his family. He was going and discussing this foreign policy, economic policy with them. Um, so first I'll distribute the participation certificates. Uh, first to the Department of Law, University of Calcutta, Natasha Aziz. Hello. Okay. Both of them? Yeah, both of them. No, actually, I don't have them in order, so. Okay, yeah. one by one, one by one. You come here. Uh, you can, yeah, we can give them. One by one. Okay, yes, Natasha Aziz. Okay. You have to come on this side. Yeah, sure. And what is one Along with certificates, we also have. Uh, that's part of the Harghar Tiranga campaign by the Ministry of Culture, yeah. Government of India. And also one of our brilliant publications, the Kaligharat Potochitro Notebooks, mm -hmm. which is also available from the souvenir shop of Victoria Memorial Hall to all the participants on behalf of the VMH. And this is also yours, the Kaligharat Potochitro Notebooks. This is really nice. Uh, next, I have Muska Nagarwal from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. Abhishek Chaube from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. Coming in at the runner-up position is Jadupur University. So I would like to call Ekolobo Bhattacharya. And Ekolobo, please stay to receive the rest of the prizes. And Oritro Ganguly, also from Jadupur University. Uh, both of you, please stay there. Sir, this one is also. And so the honor of the best team naturally goes to the Calcutta National Medical College. So I would like to invite Shagota Ghosh and Shobhik Shaha together. Thank you. There is one doctor who could have been a